Amen, amen. It's uh, so good to see you guys this morning. Thanks for being here. I am just excited for what God is doing in this church. If you are new with us, just want to say one more time, welcome. Thanks for being here. Before we get started with the message, I do want to make another announcement. I know we got a lot of stuff going on. That's why I was sprinkling them through the different elements of the service. One was during the tithe, and then we had the three. Now we got another one here. But, but at the beginning of the summer, we decided to move to one service for the summer. I just really felt like the Lord was or was saying to take a step of faith and move back to one service as our college students were back home or go back home in the summertime. And, and when I made the announcement, I mentioned that the plan was to come back to two around this time. And one of the things we value at Scent Church is just being flexible and being open to the Spirit, allowing Him to change our plans. Uh, we just want to be open-handed with Him. And, and we've been practicing that this summer in the way we've been ending our services. I don't know if you've noticed, we kind of changed things where we just kind of end it more you know, free-flowing. We have the time at the altar. And I feel like the Lord is, acting, or is asking us to practice this value of flexibility again, because as we've been getting closer to the fall, I just continue to feel like the Lord's saying, it's not time to move back to two services yet. I just feel like he wants us to hang out at one service for, for really as long as we possibly can. So I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if that looks like some of you sitting at the kids' check-in table during service. I'm kidding. That was a joke. But the point is, I, I feel like he just wants us to wait, and the reason is, is we've experienced several benefits since we've been at one service. I think the first thing that, that I would say is there's just been an authenticity to our services as there's only one, there's only one shot at it, and we're all together experiencing the same thing. The second thing is we haven't been as limited by time. Part of the reason why we've been able to, uh, to do the altar time at the end is we don't have an end time, we don't have to get to another service. We have this kind of, like this ability to wait on the Lord and let him do his thing if he wants to change it up. And then the third benefit I would say is we've just seen relationships strengthen across the church. We've really gotten to see the whole church together and there's a, a strengthening that happens there. And then the last thing, this is just like a personal thing I like, is uh, it's easier to do after church events. You know, I, I love being here, but you know, it gets to be a long day and do two services, have after church events. So I think it's been nice with like Activate, it's easier to do it after service when there's only one. So with that in mind, students are coming back next week. And as you can see, we're pretty full right now. <laughs> we're pretty full right now, and not necessarily at 10 o'clock, but by 10.40, we get pretty full, right? right? That's a joke. I'm just playing with you, but, uh, but, uh, but yeah, and our parking lot gets really full. That's why we're, we're kind of doing a test run today with the parking lot. That's why you see all the cars on this side. There you go, 10.38. Come on, Ryan. Ryan is always here really early, but uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Me and Ryan are buddies, but uh, so the point is, uh, so the cars are parked over there because we're kind of doing a test run for next week. We're going to need more space in our parking lot for all the students that are coming back. And I do expect more families to join the church. We've had families join the church. You know, it seems like once or it seems like every month we have a new family that's joining. So so point is, we are kind of adjusting some things where we're going to have some more chairs in here. Uh, we're going to have more space in the parking lot because we're parking out there. We're praying that the kids wing doesn't get too full. So we're just going to kind of go with the flow here and see what the Lord has for us as we kind of experiment with this. I want to be a church that is willing to try new things, and we're just going to see what God does. So it could be something where we're only at one service for an extra month, and then we go to two because we need to. Like, I don't want to stay at one forever, because if we stay at one forever in this space, we won't be able to reach a lot of people, right? So I do want to go to two at some point, but it's just about waiting until the proper time, okay? So with that in mind, I think next week's going to be really fun, okay? So be ready for next week. And as we head into next week, I just want to encourage you with three things. And this isn't just for next week. It's as long as we're at one service during the school year. The first thing is if you love this church, park as far away as possible, okay? So if, like, like for you, maybe that's just moving one spot down. You're like, okay, I'll park a little bit farther away. I can, I can do that. Or maybe that's parking in front or along the side here. I'm not sure, but the point is just, just park as far away as you can. Especially if you're on the Dream Team, you're getting here really early. You have some time to walk to the building park as far away as you can. That's the first thing. The second thing is sit as close to the front as possible. I love that. We're going to have some, some full rows up here because the reason for that is we want to have our back rows open for new people because I know for me, if I'm a new person, I don't want to have to do that walk all the way to the front and sit in the very front row and then get spit on by me, right? So so point is, you guys can enjoy that. So point is, <laughs> just sit as close to the front as possible. Uh, maybe for you that means moving up one row. Maybe that means moving all the way to the front. But we want to leave the back couple rows open for guests so they can come, sit, not feel like they have to you know, walk in front of us. The third thing is just pray. Pray this week as we, exper or as we experiment that the Lord would just move in power and that there would be a momentum that kind of is birthed out of the season and that God would really bless it. So I want to kind of do that right now. Let's just pray as a church as we're experimenting with this. Let's pray that the Lord would move as we trust him and that he would give us you know, solutions to make more room and all those kind of things. So Lord, uh, we thank you so much for 
uh, this morning. I thank you for the full house today. And God, I pray that you would help us as we continue with one service for at least a little while longer. We pray that you would give us just wisdom on how to do that. Uh, you give us a servant's heart to be able to make sacrifices to make room for people. And God, we pray that there would just be something amazing that happens out of this this fall. So God, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so now we're going to move into our Gospel of Mark sermon series. We've been working verse by verse through this book, and we're coming up on part 38 today. Part 38, praise him, come on. It's going to be verse 32. Yeah, Tony's pumped, let's go. So I don't know if you realize this, but we've been in one of the most challenging sections of the entire Bible over the last few weeks. So if you felt very convicted at church, blame the Bible, okay? It's the Bible's fault. When you preach it verse by verse, it challenges you a lot, okay? If you just kind of pick the ones you like, maybe it might be a little more comfortable. But the point is, when you're just going verse by verse, it's going to challenge you. And these chapters specifically, since chapter 8, have been so challenging. Jesus has been fixated on going to Jerusalem where he's going to die on the cross, and he's trying to get his disciples ready for it. He's trying to teach them what it means to follow in his footsteps and become like him. Over the last three weeks specifically, we've seen Jesus give challenging teachings on marriage, children, and then wealth last week. And last week, we saw that a rich man was challenged to sell all his possessions to follow Jesus. I didn't plan that at all to have Derek preach that message and not me. But the point is, this wasn't because his possessions are inherently bad. Okay, possessions are not inherently bad, but it's because possessions had his heart. Money and wealth had his heart. And Jesus knew if he was going to get his heart, he had to get him to give up his wealth but he wasn't willing to do that. He actually ended up walking away. Okay, so now this week, though, Jesus has another important teaching about what it means to be his disciple. And more specifically, he's going to tell us, or tell us what it means to be a leader in his kingdom. Okay, so Mark 10, 32, it says this. And they were going on the road, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed. That's referring to the, or to the disciples. And those who followed were Afraid And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask for you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those for whom it's been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great, or another way to say that is leader, whoever would be a, a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, the sermon title this morning, if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, is the cost of leadership, the cost of leadership. I'm going to pray over this as well, and then we'll jump right in. So Jesus, I pray that you would just anoint this message, that you'd preach through it, that your spirit would speak, that it would not be my words, but the Holy Spirit's words speaking through me. So God, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so every Tuesday morning, Pastor Lexi and I meet for, or meet for a staff meeting at Panera, and we always walk through what's coming up in the church, the needs of people in our church, what's going on, and what we need to be focused on in the coming weeks. In this last week, I was excited. I had just gotten back from vacation and you know, just excited to jump back in. And as we dove into everything, though, I began to feel this weight kind of come on me, just this overwhelming weight. It's like, oh, it's back again. <laughs> but after a weekend in the woods by myself, I began to feel the urgency of our mission, because it's urgent. People are, are dying, they're going to hell. There's an urgency to our mission. And I also felt the impossibility of completing the mission on our own strength. Our heart is to see hearts transformed all across the Cedar Valley, but not just the Cedar Valley, all around the world. And this is a tall task. It's not something we can do on our own strength. But not just that, there, 
there's people in our church family right now that are just going through some stuff. They're facing some challenging circumstances. They're just up against some things. And if I'm honest, sometimes I don't know how to help. I would love to fix everything. I would love to just go in and solve every problem. But the thing is, when it comes down to it, there's only so much I can do or our leaders can do. As I felt this weight, I just said to Lexi, I said, Lexi, we need more kingdom leaders. And we need people who are willing to lay down their lives for other people. Not people who are in it for themselves, but people who are just going to lay their lives down. We need people who can give until it hurts. Another way I could have said that is we need more disciples. Okay, so discipleship, it's just the process of becoming like Jesus. It's, it's being like our teacher. If you become like Jesus, you'll become a leader, right? Because kingdom leadership is all about serving others. And Jesus is like the prototype for serving other people. He gave it all for others. He gave his very life on the cross so that we might be saved. He is the best leader in the world. Disciples become leaders by default. If we can get more people to commit to discipleship, we'll naturally begin to raise up more leaders who care for others and who push the kingdom forward. If we can get more people to commit to not just receiving things from Jesus, but giving it away to others, the burden that I felt on Tuesday will begin to be lifted as we carry this thing together. And, and don't get me wrong, we have so many great disciples and great leaders in our church, but we have 100,000 people in the Cedar Valley, right? So we need more leaders. We need more people who will step up and say, I'm going to count the cost. After saying that, we prayed, you know, we just prayed to just put our weakness before the Lord and say, Lord, please send more laborers. Please help us to raise up more laborers. And I believe that the Lord will be faithful to answer that prayer, and he will answer it by calling some of you to step into kingdom leadership. And what's crazy is then I go to the text for this week, and it's about leadership, and it's about serving other people. I'm like, all right, God, what do you got this week? He's got something to say. I'm just telling you, if, if you came to church ready to take a nap, you better listen, because I just really believe that the Lord is all over this. He has been preparing my heart even before I, I had looked at the text, and I believe he has something to say. As we look forward to the fall and to the future of our church, the Lord wants us to get busy raising up kingdom leaders. He wants many of you to answer the call first to discipleship, but also to leadership. And not leadership in the worldly sense, not in the sense of the world where it's about gaining power over other people, but in the Jesus sense. You know, it's a leadership that's characterized by pouring out your life for others. It's a leadership that's characterized by being utterly sold out for God's kingdom. Okay, so it's or today in our text, we'll get a vivid picture of how we can be leaders in God's kingdom. And it starts with Jesus telling his disciples for the third time that he's going to die and rise again. He's been trying to get this through to the disciples. He is going to die. He did not come to take down Rome, but he came to die for Rome. He came to die for the sins of the world. And the religious leaders, they're going to condemn him to death. They're going to hand him over to the Romans they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. Jesus, he, he's determined here to die. He's fixated on it. He knew that in order for him to rise, he first had to die. This tells us a foundational truth about what it means to follow Jesus and something that Jesus has been trying to hammer home in these last few chapters. It's this, the way of Jesus begins with death, but ends with glory. It begins with death, but the good news is it ends with glory. As Jesus heads towards his death, he just seems to be fixated on getting his disciples to understand this. In Mark 8, he had said this. If we go back to Mark 8, he had said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For, or for whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, you first have to die to yourself. And you have to be, be willing to give up your very life. Finding your life in God's kingdom starts with giving up your life. That's where it begins. We need to get this. Paul said it this way in Galatians 2. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. In the life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. This is the way of Jesus. This is it. This is the way. There's no other way. This is the way. If you want life in Christ, you've got to die. Death to self, life to Christ. That's the way it works in the kingdom of God. Life begins when you lay it all down at the feet of Jesus. It begins when we follow Jesus down the road to Jerusalem to our own cross. 
Resurrection can only come after there's been a crucifixion. In Philippians 1, Paul says this. He says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Do you think the disciples are getting this yet? It doesn't seem like it, does it, right? James and John <laughs> didn't say this. <laughs> this gives me hope for myself. Okay, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, teacher, we want you to do whatever, or do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. <laughs> this is hilarious. It's, it's, it's funny, but it's also a little bit ironic. It's kind of devastating, actually. <laughs> Jesus has just said, he said, I'm going to die. And then his number two and three, they come to him and say, hey, are we going to get a good spot in the future kingdom? You know, I know you're going to die. It's going to really stink, but where are we going to be sitting? <laughs> the... <laughs> Alan Cole says this, he says, the petty selfishness of his followers at a time like this, when his mind was full of all that lay ahead at Jerusalem, must have cut Jesus to the quick. Cut Jesus to the quick just means it must have hurt him. Okay, so I have to think that this hurt Jesus. How selfish could his disciples be? Jesus spent virtually every minute with these disciples, like they camped in the same tent every night, or in the, <laughs> stayed in the same house, and he poured all of himself into them. He held nothing back from them. He taught them his best stuff. Again, Jesus is the best leader in the world. He's given them his best stuff. He loves on them. He sets a stunning example of how to live. And yet here they were still fixated on what they would get out of all of this. They were still following him for selfish motives. This had to be discouraging. Jesus just told them, he says, I'm going to be killed. And they didn't even take the time to sympathize with him or pray with him, or encourage him, like, hey, it's going to be okay, bud, like, we're with you to the end. Nothing like that. Instead, they were still wondering, how much glory will we get out of this all? They still wondered what was in it for them. Okay, so here's the thing, though. I don't think we can look down at the disciples. When it comes to following Jesus, we often, too, wonder what's in it for us. That's the reality. If we're honest with ourselves this morning, many of us are not following Jesus because we truly love him, but because we think following him will benefit us. It's like we've weighed all the options in life and we're like, I think that following Jesus is probably the best thing for me. And we follow him for selfish motives. Now, hear me, there are fantastic rewards, blessings and benefits to following Jesus. It is the best way, hands down. It's the best way to go. But in Christianity, motive is everything. It gets to the very core of our relationship with Jesus. What's your motive? If you've truly encounter the real Jesus of Nazareth, if you've really met him, the one that we read about in the Gospels, and you're surrendered to him, your primary motive for following him could not possibly be selfish. It has to be love. As you've encountered his love, you have to, or just should be, it should be a response where you're just so undone. Your, your primary motive is love. I just love him so much. I love Jesus. That, that should be your primary motive. You'll be so moved and so undone by his love that you can't help but follow him no matter what he asks you to do and even if you get nothing out of it you'll still follow him the son of god has bled and died for your sins and that should be enough to get your heart not what's in it for you we need to experience the love of jesus in such a way that that we don't simply want to receive something from him, but we want to give something to him and to other people. We want to give him our hearts and give the world our service. If you're truly walking with Jesus and growing in him, you can't help but lay it all down. One of the things that Jane has been, or been struggling with lately is as soon as she wakes up, the first thing she thinks about is, can I watch a movie? She says movie, but it's like TV shows, like weird YouTube Okay, if you're making dolls, like move around on YouTube, just please stop. I don't want any more of those YouTube videos. Anyways, you don't know what I'm talking about, but there's like dolls that play and there's like a, like a 40-year-old man like talking and like, hey, no. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Uh, you're gonna have to look at my YouTube channel. Anyways, so <laughs> that was in my notes. But point is, she comes into her room and, and yesterday was a little bit later actually. It was 7 a.m., you know, so we got to you know, sleep a little longer on a Saturday. Praise God for 7 a.m. But uh, she comes in, she says, can or can I watch a movie? And I encourage her to read a book or play with a toy. I said, use your imagination. Play with a toy, read your book, whatever. And she resisted me. But then I told her, I said, if you want to watch TV at all today, you need to start by doing other things. 
I told her, you need to have some fun first. And sure enough, she listened then. She went into her room, she grabbed a book, and then as I showered, she just sat right outside the shower and read. I'm like, thank you. Can you go read that somewhere else? But, <laughs> but point is, I'm so glad that she obeyed me. I'm grateful that she listened, but I can't wait till she wants to read a book first and she doesn't do it when I'm trying to shower. But I want her to want it. I want her to see my example, see Emily's example, where we don't really have the TV on much, and to follow that example and just want to do things that add more value to her than just watching YouTube. Again, motive is everything. The heart is everything. I want her to read books first because she wants to, not because she has to. In the same way, Jesus wants us to follow him because we love him, not because we'll get to sit in glory. Okay, so how does Jesus respond here? It says this in verse 38. It says, Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those to whom it has been prepared. Okay, so I'm actually really impressed with Jesus' response. I know as a leader that if I had told my, my closest three the same thing three times and they kept, or kept missing it this dramatically, I probably would have been pretty frustrated. Jesus doesn't really seem to be frustrated. He just seems to be a, a bit concerned. He says that they don't know what they're asking for. They're ignorant of what they're requesting. If they truly knew what they were asking for, they wouldn't ask for it. And when Jesus speaks of a cup and a baptism, he's talking about the cost of following him. Jesus seems to be saying that if you want to sit in glory, you have to die too. If you want this kind of glory, you have to also die. They don't get to skip the death part, right? The way of Jesus, again, begins with death. James and John, they needed to count the cost of leadership and greatness in God's kingdom before they asked for it. Glory belongs to those who truly follow the way of Jesus. That's what he's trying to say. So to sit in glory, we must suffer and die just like he's going to. This isn't something we do because we're trying to earn something. But it's something we do because our hearts have been so changed by his love that we just can't help but lay it all down at his feet. We can't help but respond by laying down our life for God and other people. With that in mind, Jesus was not mad at them for asking to sit in glory, but he wants them to understand what they're actually asking for. Although his way does certainly end in glory and in resurrection, it first begins with death. Okay, so glory always comes with a cost. It always costs something. If you want true glory, if you want to have a life that, that truly makes a difference, it comes at a price. It comes at a cost. Although their motives were off here, James and John would end up paying that price, and they would end up getting that glory. Although we don't know if James and John are technically sitting at the right and left hand of Jesus in glory, we do know that they drank this cup and they received this baptism. They truly followed in Jesus' footsteps and died with him. Spiritually speaking, they sit at his right and left hand. Alan Cole says this, this quote absolutely wrecked me this week. It just, it just, yeah, just wrecked me. Let's read it. It says, there was a double irony in their request and that those who actually, or those actually on the right and left of Jesus at the great moment of his triumph were to be two crucified terrorists, making plain what in cold reality it meant to share in his cup and in his baptism. In that sense, the day would come, whether in Jerusalem or on Patmos, that the two brothers would indeed be on Christ's right and left hand. Just as the criminal sat on Jesus' right and left hand, James and John would end up being at his right and left hand in suffering. James was actually the first disciple to be martyred in Jerusalem. John would end up dying in exile on the island of Patmos. That's where he wrote the book of Revelation. Although they look like idiots in this passage, we're not worthy of who they became. They both gave up their physical lives for Christ. But not just that, they died to themselves. They were transformed. They could quote Galatians 2.20 with the utmost sincerity. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And how do we know that? Well, we know that because we have John's writings from later in life. And we see his transformation. If you read his gospel or his letters, you read from someone who was radically transformed by Jesus from this young, zealous achiever who was after his own glory to someone whose heart was warmed and transformed by the love of God. He said these two verses. I could quote a ton of stuff. I'm just going to do these two. He said, 
Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, if anyone loves glory, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 3, 16, he says this, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay it down our lives for the brothers. Look at John living in the way of Jesus, passing on the faith to another generation of believers, passing on what Jesus told him to other people. These brothers, they started out with an unholy ambition. They were in it for themselves. They were selfish, they were unloving, but somewhere on the journey, they transformed, they changed. They went from ambitious boys to holy men. They went from selfish punks to gentle fathers of the faith. They became like Jesus, who did not love the things of the world and who laid down his life for the world. But for that to happen, they had to bear the cost of glory. They had to drink the cup and be baptized in the baptism. Discipleship and leadership in God's kingdom always comes with a cost. Okay, so let me ask you this morning, are you paying the cost that comes with discipleship or are you trying to go down the road of least resistance? Are you paying the cost? If so, then you may become like James and John. Generations from now, people may speak of your transformation from an unholy, ambitious young man or woman or old man and woman to a holy, gentle person who loved Jesus and, and truly lived like him. And you may get to sit at Jesus' right and left hand. After pointing to James and John's future, Jesus then pivots and he teaches the rest of the disciples too. He says this, and when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. So they're mad at him. They're like, dude, why didn't you invite us to be part of this? And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, so Jesus, he calls all the disciples together and he teaches them that, that leadership in his kingdom is different than leadership in the world. In the world, the rulers simply gain power or step into authority because they want power over people. They're in it for themselves. But in the kingdom, those who lead are in it for other people. They just want to serve. The higher you go up in leadership in God's kingdom, the further down you go in service and pouring out your life for other people. As a leader in God's kingdom, people are not there to serve you. You are there to serve them. You are a slave to all. Jesus modeled this as he laid down his life to save many. With that in mind, the road to influence, the road to greatness, the road to leadership in God's kingdom is the road of humility, service, and love for other people. Leaders or kingdom leaders are servants. Kingdom leaders are servants. It's easy to look at James and John and to scoff at their desire for greatness. But I actually think this desire for greatness in its purest form was put there by God. We need more people in the kingdom of God who want to be great. It's not that we have too many people who want to be great. It's that we have too many apathetic people that don't really care that much about being great in God's kingdom. We need people who want their lives to count and are not given into a spirit of apathy. The problem is we have bad definitions of greatness. If we can get the definition correct, but keep the ambition, it can become a holy ambition. Can I get an amen, somebody? Come on. Let's go. True greatness in God's kingdom is being willing to utterly give of yourself for God and other people. You just lay your heart, your calendar, your bank account, your energy, your time, your mind, all of it at Jesus' feet, and you say, you can have it all, God. You can have, okay. We sing the bridge. <laughs> I'm going to sing it again. Get up here, Derek. I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> if we can catch this definition of greatness, if we can get the right definition, then we should surely pursue it. Come on, let's pursue this. Let's lay it all down for God. In fact, the only way that God's kingdom's gonna go forward is if people answer this call to become leaders. For the kingdom to go forward, we must answer the call to become true kingdom leaders. In the Old Testament, the kingdom of Israel was built through men like Moses who, who put up with the rebellious people in the wilderness for 40 years. He, he helped free them from Egypt, and then he led them around in the wilderness as they grumbled and complained and built golden calves. He just continued to lead and serve. He did that for 40 years. It was built th uh, through men like David who pursued God with his whole heart even when the culture wasn't. It was built through people like, what did I write down? People like Elijah. <laughs> I was having a little brain fart there. Who, who preached, Elijah preached the truth even when the king of Israel opposed him. Right, it was built through these people 
who are willing to pay the price. In the New Testament, the church expanded and, and the kingdom was built through people like Peter, who got up on the day of Pentecost and preached the gospel and 3,000 people got saved. It was built through people like James, who we read about here, who was the first martyr of the 12 disciples. And John, who died in isolation on the island of Patmos and wrote the book of Revelation for us to still read today. It was built through people who laid it all down. And this has continued throughout church history. The great ones in church history are the ones who truly lay it all down for Jesus. The kingdoms only went forward through people who are willing to lay their lives down at Jesus' feet. The only way, here's the thing, the only way for the next generation to know Jesus is if the current generation pays a price. That's the only way. We have to pay a price for the sake of our sons and daughters. We must do what our mothers and fathers have done for us and pay a price in our generation so that more people can come to know Jesus. We have to pray and seek the Lord and let him change our hearts so patterns can be or can be rooted out and we don't pass them on to our kids and our sons and daughters in the faith. We have to do the hard work. We have to pay the price of leadership. So with that in mind, are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to go through the actual process of discipleship, which lets Jesus get in there? I feel like Jesus is poking at me like every day, like that part of your heart needs to change. Oh, okay. He's like doing surgery on me every day. Are we willing to go through the process of discipleship, not just consumerism? and say, Jesus, change me. I want my life to be an offering of worship to you, but for that to happen, I have to be transformed. I don't want to be conformed to the patterns of this world. I want to be transformed by the renewal of my mind. But for that to happen, you have to go down the road of discipleship. Are you willing to pay the price of transformation? Are you willing to serve others even when they don't give you anything in return? There's nothing in it for you at all. Are you willing to do that? Because Jesus said, if you are, when you serve those people, you're actually serving him. That's the thing. When we serve the least of these, we are serving Jesus himself. It's not about what we get out of it. It's about serving those who God loves. Are you willing to pay that price? Are you willing to pursue a dream that might not happen in your lifetime and lay it all down, even if you don't get to see the glory of the dream come, pa or come to pass? Are you willing to pay a price? I hope you are because our sons and daughters are counting on it. And I do believe that many of you want to pay this price. If you do, there's a blueprint in the New Testament of how we can become a leader. Again, being a leader in God's kingdom is really just about being a disciple of Jesus, being a real disciple. Okay, so we can kind of use these as synonyms. Okay, so here's the New Testament leadership pipeline. Three things, worship, community, and mission. You can throw them all up here. Worship, community, and mission. We're living, everything we do as a church is just kind of centered around these three things. We believe if people worship Jesus with their lives, if they engage in community and they live on mission, then they're going to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. We're putting all our chips in this basket. That's the pipeline. If you live a life of worship, community, and mission. If you worship Jesus, not just with song, but through allowing him to change your life, if you belong to the church and you actually belong to brothers and sisters in Christ, and if you live on mission, you will become a disciple and a leader, even if you don't have a title. Who cares about the title, right? No one needs to call you King Tut or something or, or you know, prophet so-and-so. It doesn't matter. Even if you don't have a title, you'll be a leader because you'll be living like Jesus and Jesus is a leader. If you become like him, you'll be a leader as well. Okay, so with that in mind, over the last year, I've been working hard in prayer and just, you know, thinking through it on what our pipeline is for leadership here at St. Church or, or discipleship. Again, we could just call it the pipeline to discipleship. And this is the pipeline we're using. We're using this to develop disciples and to identify future leaders in our church. Every person who wants to be a leader in our church has to go through this pipeline. And this is it. Activates the first step. Okay, so you wonder, what's the point of activate? It launches you into a life of worship, community, and mission. That's what it's focused on, those three things, launching you into that. Okay, and then the second thing is worship Jesus. We want to get every person that's part of that church to actually worship Jesus. And that looks like uh, spending daily time with Jesus, participating and being here on Sunday mornings, being a part of it, and through the process, committing to the process of becoming like Jesus. That's what worship looks like. There's more to it than that, but that's how I summarized it. The second, or the third thing is belong to community. Participate in the life of the church generally. So when we do things, be with the church. You gotta be with your brothers and sisters, but community specifically. So communities is our new name for small groups. I'll talk about that more in the coming weeks, but those are launching on September 21st here at the church. It's Wednesday nights. I'm really fired up about it. I've been praying about it like literally since the beginning of 2022, how to just make those better. So I want to encourage you to plan to be a part of those starting September 21st on Wednesday nights here at the church. 
The fourth thing is live on mission, okay? So serve on the dream team. We want you to serve on the dream team, not because we're just trying to get jobs done, but because we believe serving transforms you, and we believe that to truly be all that God's called you to be, you need to be a part of building the church, you know, specifically here, but also building the church outside these walls, which it can also look like giving, inviting people to come to church or come to communities, and also through sharing Jesus with your lips, with other people, and in conversation throughout the week, right? Going out, being the hands and feet of Jesus, sharing him. And there's more to this stuff, but again, this is how I summarize it. And the last thing is Elevate, which is going to be our leadership class or discipleship class. It's going to launch in 2023. I don't know when yet, but we're going to launch. We're actually taking all of our community leaders through it now. I'm kind of developing the curriculum as we go. And it's been, honestly, it's been amazing. God's been moving in power at every Elevate meeting. And at some point, I want like, literally everyone to go through it even if you don't have a leadership title in our church, because I believe it's going to be transformative for you. So that's going to come sometime in 2023. And this map is going to be tweaked, right? It's not like I figured everything out. It's going to be tweaked as we go on the road to becoming a church that's all about discipleship. But I just want to say that anyone who has a heart to lead, if you want to answer the call that, that I believe that Jesus is putting on you this morning, this is the pipeline in St. Church, and no one's exempt from this pipeline. Okay, so I pray that that some of you this morning would catch the vision for kingdom leadership specifically within our church, but also in general, but, but specifically in our church as we begin this journey of trying to be a church that develops leaders and raises up disciples. Okay, so the main idea this morning is this. Kingdom leadership comes at the cost of laying down your life. Okay, so over the last year, I've been in community with a small group of, of pastors who have committed to bearing each other's burdens. We all had this, this common need, we felt like, to have other pastors to just meet with and bear each other's burdens. So, uh, so we try to do this about, about once a month, and essentially we just sit down, we share how things are going in our own hearts, and our churches, and then we pray over each other, we prophesy over each other, we do it once a month. And every time we meet, God moves in power. It's been, it's been really, really special. It's been something happening in my life that I haven't shared a lot about publicly, but it's just been a really special group, you know, just in... In March, we were in the kids' wing, just weeping. Well, I was weeping. I'm always, anyways, I have a crying problem. Anyways, we're, we're seeking the Lord together, right, for this church, right, for our families, for their churches. It's really, really special. Uh, this last month, I was having a tough day, and I reached out to the, the, the friends through a group chat and just kind of told them, hey, I need some prayers, gave them some specifics as to why I did. And Drew Meyer, who, who did our Holy Spirit conference back in February, he's a part of that group. He's kind of one of the founding members with me. And... Uh, and he shot me a private text right when I sent that group text. And he said, I'm kicking myself, man. This morning, the Lord prompted me to call you and check on you. I knew I needed to check on you, but I got so busy. I'm sorry for not being obedient to Jesus. And when I received that text, one, I was already bearing a lot of burdens. But I just couldn't help but get emotional. I was just moved. The fact that the Lord loved me so much to tell Drew that I was struggling and the fact that Drew cared enough to apologize for not reaching out, like I could tell he genuinely was kicking himself, it just meant the world to me. I'm like, man, who am I to have a brother like this in Christ? Drew, or Drew has always uh, sought to serve. He's always sought to serve me specifically. He's always been a leader to me. We're friends, and he's a leader to me. And it's not because of his position. It's not because of his gifts or his good looks. He is good looking, but it's because of his heart posture. He truly wants to serve. And this is what it looks like to be a leader in God's kingdom. This is the cost of greatness. That, that something that you kick yourself for is not loving someone well enough, right? It just kind of keeps you up and like, man, I should reach out to that person. If you want to be great, if you want to lead, you have to offer your life up on the altar and give it to God and say, God, I want to serve others. You've got to put other people before yourself. You've got to actually care about other people. You've got to actually think about other people you got to love other people. you got to follow in the way of Jesus who, who laid down his life for us. Okay, so let me ask you again. Are you prepared to pay the price? Are you prepared? And will you commit to living a life of worship, community, and mission? And not just for your own sake. It's going to benefit you, but not just for your own sake, but so God can use you to help save the world. Come on, are you willing? Are you willing to answer that call? Think about the leaders who have gone before me who answered a call. I would not be here today for certain people who answered a call to pay a price. The kingdom can only go forward when people take up the call. Here's the thing. When people follow in the way of James and John, James and John, they, they truly went down the way. When they follow in their way, then they can truly be great in God's kingdom. James and John's story gives me so much hope for my discipleship. Man, God, look what you did in their lives. 
James and John's life, if we can follow their way, we can say that with sincerity, follow the way of James and John, then we might be able to be leaders in God's kingdom. All right, I want to close. I, well, not close, but I'm going to open up for some prayer. Okay, I just feel like the Lord's doing something. If, if the worship team could come, what I'm going to do now is I just want to have some quiet prayer time. I, I want you to hear from Jesus. No song. We're just going to play the light keys, and the altars are going to be open. We'll bring the lights down for, for sake of intimacy with the Lord, all that. But, but the altars will be open. I want you, if you're hearing this call, I want you to be bold. Because, you know, leadership, to be a leader, you got to be bold. I want you to come up and pray at the altars and seek the Lord. For me, every transformative moment, like every key, like hinge moment for me has happened at an altar. Like whether it be an altar in my home, at my prayer chair in my office, or whether it be at the altar of a church, you know. In 2011, I first answered the call to leadership at an altar in Boone, Iowa. I got a vision of God reaching the campus of UNI, and I said, I'll give my life to that, Lord. That was the first time I truly heard the call to leadership. In 2013, I was in Minneapolis, Minnesota at an altar. At the, or the Lord said, you're, you're called to reach you and I, but you're also called to plant churches. I'm like, what does that look like? Well, here we are, but, but that's 2013. 2019 at an altar in Ames, Iowa, God called me specifically to plant Scent Church. The point is there's something about when you step out and you get on your knees before the Lord and say, Lord, here am I, send me that he just speaks to you. So I wanna give you that opportunity to have your own moment, your own memorial with God this morning at this altar, or if you wanna pray in your seats, that's fine too. But yeah, let's bring the lights on. I'll pray for us and we're just gonna have a quiet, time of response and prayer here. So Jesus, uh, this morning we come to you. And God, I pray that all across this room, people would answer the call to become true kingdom leaders, not just by title or by stature or something like that, but, but by living like you and truly being your disciple. Lord, help us to be courageous enough to answer the call. We thank you. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Do what you want to do in these final moments of our service. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name. All right, the altars are open. The prayer team also, if you could come and be available, that'd be great.